All right. So while they're getting off stage, let me ask you guys a question. Show of hands. How many of you currently have architect somewhere in your title? It's like a scattering of people. How many people want to have architect somewhere in your title? Show of hands. The rest of you, those of you who did not raise your hands, why are you still here? Go home, the conference is over. You could like beat traffic, get an early dinner, catch Game of Thrones on TV or something. A lot of people end up coming to this session. I've, I've done a, this talk, something similar to it, for many, many years, and a lot of people come up to me afterwards and say, I'm really interested to know what an architect is, what an architect does. And I'm interested in becoming an architect, but I'm concerned because I heard that the word architect is Latin for cannot code anymore. And that bothers me. It does, in fact, have a purpose, and it's not just retirement. <laughs> because if you think about it, you could be forgiven for believing that, right? I mean, you, you, you come into the industry, you're a junior programmer, you're learning to write code. After a few years, you get promoted to senior programmer, and you start working maybe with different languages. And then maybe you become a team lead and you start making decisions about how, you know, what the team will use and, and, and you know, which modules we're gonna make use of. And then one day you become an architect and you never get promoted again. <laughs> Unless you wanna go into management because if it's one thing that people who know how to program computers know how to do, it's manage other people. Because people are deterministic and easy to figure out, you just have to read their source code. <laughs> so this talk is essentially to try to get a grip on what this thing architecture is, what an architect does, and more importantly, to try to make sure that we keep a fairly firm footing on the ground. There are a lot of times when an architecture talk will begin and you start hearing about, you know, overall big picture abstractions and so forth, and, and people start talking about architecture somehow like it's the second coming. And, you know, if only we'd had good architecture, the, the UK would have voted to stay in Europe. I mean, you know, it was just, it was all an architecture problem. We're gonna, we're gonna try to make sure we get to some good answers but with a very pragmatic focus. Because one of the things that concerns me is that it's really, really easy to take pot shots at the architects and architecture. I mean, Joel Spolsky, uh, many of you may not have read him, but Joel Spolsky is probably one of the best humorists in our industry. He's got two posts in particular. The first one, I'll leave it to you to read. It will come very close to home for you as a Java programmer, talking about factory builder, builder, factory, factory builder patterns. And the second one, he talks about architecture astronauts. How many of you have ever flown on a commercial airliner? Yeah, pretty much everybody by this point, right? There's probably like one you know, 80-year-old COBOL programmer out there who's still like, no, I prefer to drive. <laughs> but all of you then have been through the safety briefing where they tell you that in the event that something should happen, and I love it how they say in the unlikely event that, <laughs> yeah, if it wasn't that all unlikely, you wouldn't tell me about it on every single flight. They talk about those masks that will pop down out of the ceiling that you're supposed to put yours on before you put on anybody else's. And these masks are supplemental oxygen. Because funny thing, when you fly at 30,000 feet, as Bruce was talking about in the talk right before here, there's not enough oxygen. You can't, you will literally suffocate. You can't get enough air into your lungs to survive. And there's been some interesting documented behavior about people who suffer from oxygen deprivation. They start experiencing mental breakdowns. They start processing more slowly. They start making bad or uninformed decisions. They start hallucinating, 
which sounds a lot like the architect from your last project. <laughs> Hence, Spolsky calls these guys architecture astronauts, people who are so high up in the air. Have you ever listened to the architect? Let me tell you what the system looks like from a 100,000 foot view. 100,000 feet in the air, dude, there is no air. I don't know how you're still alive. But architects always talk about taking this really high-level view. They're astronauts, but they forgot to put on their supplemental oxygen. I asked a group of friends what their definition of the word architect was, and these were some of the answers that I came back with. How many of you know one of these people? How many of you are one of these people? No, don't, don't put your hand up, <laughs> idiot. Seriously, why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? For any other industry, the person who is supposed to be at the pinnacle, this person who's theoretically the best at their job, I mean, this is, this is held up as a promotion. Architect is supposed to be one of the best technical people in the room, right? We don't make fun of chief surgeons. We don't make fun of the, 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 the founder of the legal practice. We don't make fun of the partners. We don't make fun of the dean of college, unless you're a student there, and then you're not making fun of him. You just want to prank him, right? We don't make fun of people who've reached the pinnacle in their careers in other industries. Why is it okay for us to make fun of the architect? And I believe it has to do very fundamentally with the nature of software as a whole. See, before I get to this, I wanna play something for you guys. How many of you have seen the movie Tron? Not the first one, but the second one, the most recent reboot with uh, Jeff Bridges. Yeah, it's a good movie. I liked it. The fact that I look like Jeff Bridges has nothing to do with that. <laughs> I want you guys to listen to this for a little bit. Can I get the audio back up, please? The grid. The grid. Actually, today it would be called the cloud, but we'll, we'll let that go. A digital frontier. Digital frontier, I'm liking it. I tried to picture clusters of information as they move through the computer. Try to picture clusters of information as they move through the computer. I'm, I'm with you, Flynn, keep going. What did they look like? What, what did they look like? Ships, motorcycles. Were the circuits like freeways? Time out. <laughs> Ships, motorcycles, were the circuits like freeways? I mean, this now all of a sudden puts Maven in a whole different light. <laughs> because now when you do a Maven build, it's like your whole machine looks basically like Warsaw at 5 p.m. Nobody's going anywhere. Right, you've got this little build agent motorcycle trying to get around the city, trying to do stuff, and meanwhile, Maven the Titanic is moving through the main streets. <laughs> you try to stop the build, the Titanic's like, no, nah, I'm still going, man, I'm the Titanic. <laughs> you, you're irrelevant at that point. It's interesting, isn't it? When you ask people who are not technologists to point to the software, what do they point to? They point to the monitor. They point to the thing that's showing them something. And we, as technologists, we laugh at this. Ha, how silly these people are. Those are just pixels. We understand that those are just pixels. That's not really the software. The software is in here. As a matter of fact, if we crack open a laptop, preferably somebody else's, not your own, but if we crack open a laptop and we get a microscope and we look really, really hard, we will see the things that we work with, right? We'll see the objects, we'll see the threads, right? We'll see the garbage collector, this old man with the broom kind of sweeping the objects off to one side. It'll be really easy to know when we're out of memory because the heap will be really tiny, right? There won't be any space for any more objects. And if we want to examine the state of the program, we could just pick up one of those objects and kind of look at it. 
You know, oh yeah, yeah, I can see you've got a wrong value here. We can fix, put it back. Software is ephemeral. You can't touch it. You can't see it, smell it, taste it, hear it. It's all there, but it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction on top of an abstraction on top of an abstraction on top of an abstraction on top of, I don't know how deep we want these levels of abstraction to go. As a matter of fact, when you are sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor can draw your blood, look at it under a microscope, determine things about you. And if he's not sure, he can just ask you some questions. How are you feeling? Ah, a little under the weather. When we try to diagnose sick software, what do we do? We ask another program. This is the moral equivalent of you going to the doctor's office with your best friend or your spouse. And the doctor says, how are you feeling? And your best friend goes, he's sick. <laughs> and the doctor says, what hurts? And your wife says, his arm. <laughs> and it's like, wait, wait. I, uh, Okay, yeah, it's my arm. You know, cause you're, you're not gonna disagree with your wife, right? Doctor says, well, what happened? She says, oh, well, he was doing this other stupid thing the other day, yeah, what, whatever. It doesn't make any sense because software is this incredibly ephemeral, abstract thing. We don't see it, we don't touch it, we don't feel it. When I show you these two pictures here, and I ask you, were these two buildings constructed the same way, using the same materials, the same process, the same methodologies, it's pretty reasonable to imagine, no, they weren't. And as a matter of fact, if I were to bring one of those clueless users, those idiot management boss types, if I were to bring them into here and sit them down, and say, do you believe that those two buildings are in fact the same? They were constructed the same way. They have the same degree of quality. They have, most people would say no. Because the doghouse you can build in a weekend. Go out to the lumber mill, go to the scrap bin, pick up some two by fours, some nails, slap that thing together. You don't really care if it leaks because it's not like the dog is actually going to sleep in the doghouse because despite however many times you tell your kid, no, the dog does not get to sleep on your bed, guess where the dog sleeps when it's raining outside? Not that I'm still bitter or anything. These are two very fundamentally different buildings because people can latch on to these things. They understand the difference. We as software developers, when we look at software, we can see the difference, but nobody else can. There's a psychologist from many, many years ago, a gentleman by the name of Carl Jung, who theorized that we all of us share a certain mental space. He called it the collective unconscious. And in this space, we all sort of feel the same fears that other people are feeling. It's kind of like the force. And we as programmers can feel ripples in the force when bad things really happen. And one of those classic things that we all know about, even if you've never experienced it personally, is when the boss comes into your cube one day and says, hey, I was just talking with marketing guys and they need a quick prototype. Yeah, and there's a couple of people who are like, oh shit, I know where this is going. And you say, fine, fine, I can put together a prototype, not a problem, you know, just go grab some bootstrap, some jQuery, maybe some AngularJS, because you wanted to play around with these anyway. And this is a prototype, who cares if you get it wrong, right? And so you slap together something, maybe throw in some dummy data and so forth, and so the next week, boss comes into your cube with the two guys from marketing and says, hey, what have you got? And you show it to them. And that's when you start to feel like an action hero, because as you're showing this off, everyone wants, their eyes are getting bigger and wider. They're like, that's amazing. That's great. That's terrific. And then you can see the thought in your boss's eyes, and you're like, as he says, ship it. <laughs> You've all felt this story. That was that ripple in the collective unconscious, the, the, the voice of a mil millions of souls all screaming out at once. Thank you, Obi-Wan. So the next time your boss comes to you and says, hey, I want a prototype, you're like, ha, no. 
Ooh, I know what's going to happen here. I have felt the force. I am a Jedi, right? I even have the Star Wars replica plastic lightsaber to go with it. I know what's going to happen here. And so your boss comes back to you a week from now and says, hey, how are things going? And you're like, boss, we are making amazing progress. We have just about finished iteration zero. We have just decided like what the name of the project will be, we're gonna, what, what the repository will look like up on GitHub, which libraries we're gonna use for this thing. We've, we're still sort of figuring out whether we wanna use MongoDB or CouchDB, but we should have that decision by the end of the day. And we've actually sat down and written a preliminary set of stories. We figure this project will probably take about six to nine months. <laughs> and your boss says, what the fuck? <laughs> and he's right because he wanted a prototype. And you just gave him the estimate for a full-blown project. We don't even know if we're gonna do this project yet, and you've already started it. And your boss says, you're fired. And you're like, screw you, I quit anyway. <laughs> because I can't work for a man who can't tell the difference between these two buildings. But the funny thing is, nobody can. Nobody can. Look. Point to the software anywhere in this room. Touch it, feel it. It's all abstract, it's all ephemeral, it's all something completely non-existent. This is part of the reason why the rest of the world thinks we're nuts. Because we talk about things that, as if they exist. We talk about threads, we talk about objects, right? We draw this line through code. None of it's real. And then architects, part of their job is to stamp another level of abstraction on top of all those abstractions, such to the point that programmers think they're nuts. All right, let's just reboot. Let's just start over. Architecture. I pulled this off of one of the many dictionary websites. I forgot to cite it, my apologies, but these are not uh, unrealistic definitions of the term. Building design, the art and science of designing and constructing buildings. I don't think there's really any argument over that one. Building style, style or fashion of building, especially one that is typical of a period of history or a particular place. We can certainly talk about the styles of architecture, for example, that are different between downtown Seattle and downtown Krakow. There's a slight difference between those two, or even between downtown Stockholm and downtown Krakow. There's very clearly this sense of style that permeates the buildings that we live and work and, and sleep in. But then the third one, Structure of a computer system, design structure and behavior of a computer system, microprocessor, or system program. And right there I want to stop. Because look at the scope of that definition. Computer system, microprocessor, or system program. You don't get much wider than that. I mean, if, if architecture was really about distributed systems, the way that a lot of us kind of made it out to be back during the 2000s when Java and EJB and so forth, architecture is all about where do I put the EJBs? If that were the case, then that would explain why the Intel chips run so hot. Because if you're trying to do EJBs on the chip, that would probably waste a lot of cycles. But we do talk about Intel architecture versus ARM architecture. We can talk about the architecture of a virtual machine. We can talk about the differences in architecture between the Java virtual machine, the common language runtime, and Parrot, and some of the other virtual machines that have merged over time. The differences in architecture between those and LLVM, which is now what's powering the Max tool chain for iOS and so forth. And we can talk about certainly the architecture of compilers. We can talk about architecture of a lot of different things. So it's not just about the classes and the objects and the modules and the remote connections between them. It's something else. There's something different there. Something that I don't think we've really explored all that much. Which then, I think, begs the philosophical question. How many of you, show of hands, last time, I promise, how many of you have ever worked on an architecture that you thought was good? Show of hands. Okay, keep them up for just a second. Keep them up. 
and look around. About half the room has their hand up. And I asked if you've ever worked on a good architecture and only half the room has their hand up. That's kind of an indictment of our industry, if you ask me. Now, one of the things that you start asking yourself is, well, what made this architecture good? And frequently answers will be, well, it was simple. What do you mean by simple? Well, it really wasn't all that complicated to get in, get started, start working, you know, know kind of what to do next. Other people said it was extensible because we needed to, we didn't know exactly what we were building in the beginning and we needed to be able to extend it in various ways. Others people, other people have talked about composable, the idea that I can take disparate parts and plug them together because that's what we needed to build and so on and so on and so on. And then I will ask you, all right, well, this architecture that you were working on, could you have built World of Warcraft with it? And usually everybody starts smiling and saying, no, no, of course not. We're, we're a banking financial trading system. We wouldn't build a massively multiplayer online role-playing game with that. And I say, well, would you use the World of Warcraft architecture for your financial system? No, 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 no. Even though we just agreed that both of these are good architectures. What about using World of Warcraft architecture to build Microsoft Word? It probably would make Word a lot more fun. <laughs> ha ha, I've reached level 70. I can now save my document. <laughs> awesome. Oh well, yeah, well my level 80 Night Ralph Ranger says that your document sucks. Yeah, I could definitely make revisions between parties a lot more interesting too. This begs a really interesting question then. If I can have a good architecture that's good in one place, but it's not necessarily applicable in any other scenario, that suggests that architectures reside within a particular context. That suggests that the real goal of a software architecture is not somehow to be a one-size-fits-all reusable thing that other people can just pick up and run with, but in fact it is tuned to the particular problems of the project you're trying to solve. But we're still back to the question of what is it? Well, fundamentally, if you ask me, it's a set of answers. Imagine for a moment you're a software developer and you go to work for, I don't know, let's say Amazon, just because they happen to be neighbors to me. I live in Seattle. And your job is to work on the e-commerce team, specifically working on calculating the tax rates for a user's bundle of goods. They've gone through, they filled out their shopping cart, now they want to check out and you need to calculate the tax. So how, what do you do? Well, the first thing you need to do, obviously, is you need to get the bundle of goods. Where do you get it? Do you have to open a connection to the database or is that already present somewhere? Is the connection already present somewhere? When I'm finished with the connection, do I shut it down or do I leave it open for somebody else to use? What do I use to fetch this bundle of goods? How do I find the shopping cart? Is there some sort of identifier I use to find this? Do I already know the user in question? Speaking of the user in question, how do I know where they live in order to know what the tax rate is? How do I know where these goods are shipping from? Because sometimes that will have an impact as well. All of these things are questions that a developer will ask on a daily basis. And only some of them have to do with the actual details of the business problem I'm trying to solve, a significant number of them will be purely infrastructural in nature. A software architecture basically answers those questions before the developer even asks them. All the other stuff, and this definition, by the way, scales to all those other things. In an Intel-style architecture, for example, I will prefer to store parameters, I will prefer to store local variables, et cetera, on the thread stack rather than in registers, which is very different from the ARM style of architecture. The way in which I do jumps, the way in which I come back as part of a, a, a terminate routine, et cetera, all of that, those are answers that the Intel engineers have laid out for you already. And if you want to get the best performance out of an Intel chip, you'll follow along with their architecture. Ditto for ARM, ditto for any other 
hardware that's out there. The same thing is true in languages, the same thing is true in operating systems, same thing is true in your architecture. It's all about these answers that you give people because ultimately, the goal of a software architecture, there's a gentleman from Microsoft many years ago, oops, I went too quick, many years ago, who said, quote, our desire is to have developers using our software fall naturally into the pit of success. If you just kind of coast and go with the flow, you just do the most obvious thing, you will be successful. That's what makes a good architecture. It is enables developers to fall naturally into the pit of success. It's just a set of answers. Now, how we document those answers. Well, that's a completely different story. Some people will prefer to do it in PowerPoint. Some people will prefer to do it in Visio. Others will prefer to do it in Word. Sometimes people will prefer to do it on a whiteboard and then take pictures and post it to Twitter. Look, our architecture, box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder. Isn't it amazing? Whatever the particular medium you choose to use to describe it, all you are really doing is describing some of these answers. And it's unfortunate because we frequently put too much emphasis on pictures and not enough on prose. Okay, that's great. I see boxes and arrows and a cylinder and whatnot. Where do I get the database connection again? How do I get hold of this? A lot of times, architects will write initial prototypes and say, look, this is how it works. That's great, that's good. That shows me how to do some of the very simple things, but what about more of the complex scenarios? Well, by that point, the architect has long since died. You just need to capture these answers somehow. So how do we do that? What makes up a good architecture? Well, interestingly enough, I've been doing some reading in the management space. Yes, I admit it, I'm actually a technology manager now. I, man, I, man, I run teams, not compilers. I know, so disappointing. But it's interesting because the world of management has this concept that they call strategy. And there's good strategy and there's bad strategy and there's a lot of overlap between a good business strategy and a bad one and a good software architecture and a bad one. The idea is that a strategy should be a set of principles that sort of guide the direction of the company. And that's basically what architecture should do as well. It should be a set of decisions, a set of guiding principles that you as a developer, when you wake up in the morning and you come into the office and you sit down at your laptop and you start to work, you know how everything is supposed to work. They're guiding principles. You know where that connection is. You know how long you're supposed to execute. You know whether or not you need to make your stuff thread safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, part of the thing is we don't want to lay this down too strongly. I don't want to say you should always because there is really never a case where you should always. Those of you who have seen me speak before know that I have a really, really big thing about best practices. There are no such things. And I've stood up at conferences for years and I've said there are no such things as best practices. Everything has to be evaluated in terms of its context. And at one point I was doing a show in the US and I said this, there are no such thing as best practices. And somebody in the audience challenged me and said, yes, there are. And I said, really? Name one. Doesn't have to be software anywhere in life. Name a best practice. And this gentleman said, breathing. And I said, underwater? <laughs> See, there is no such thing as a best practice. There are practices, there are ideas, concepts. The patterns community, I think, had this right. There are solutions to problems within a given context that yield certain consequences. It's a four-part tuple. There's no case where one thing will ever be best and you would always want to do it. They're always within context. You always have to evaluate them based on where you are, what you're doing, what you're expecting, etc. They need to be 
guidelines, signposts, not guardrails. And interestingly enough, when we start talking about business strategies, the management crowd says very similar kinds of things. The core of strategy work is always the same, discovering the critical factors in a situation and designing a way of coordinating and focusing actions to deal with those factors. Architecture, in many respects, is a way of coordinating developers to all do the same thing. Because otherwise, if I don't have, for example, a database connection pool, developers will go ahead and optimize to their local optima. In other words, I'll just create a connection, and I'll use it, and then I'll throw it away when I'm done. And this is how your web server ends up opening 23 database connections to the same database as you move through various components in the system. And that, not surprisingly, is what makes it slow. Good strategy honestly acknowledges the challenges being faced, provides an approach to overcoming them. Bad strategy covers up its failure to guide by embracing the language of broad goals, ambition, vision, and values. Anybody gone back to read the Java 2 Enterprise Edition specification recently? Java EE was going to change the world. It was going to make everything more secure, more scalable, more performant, more everything, but it never quite described how. It was just going to do these things. Tip number one for when you're working with an architecture that may or may not be all that sound is when you start talking to them and they start describing in terms of the goals rather than the mechanics. If we do this, it will be amazing. Okay, but how do we do this? But it will be amazing. It's like South Park. Step one, steal underwear. <laughs> Step three, profit! No South Park fans? Come on. Do I have to kill Kenny for you to laugh? All right. What I believe actually makes for a really, really good software architecture then is uh, what, what are called simple rules. And I say what are called because this is actually a book by these two individuals where they're talking specifically about how to create decision making around business strategy, but it actually works very, very well for software. What are they? Well, they're just basically things, typically, uh, there's some rules around it, which I'll get into in a second, but they're, they're ways for developers to sort of evaluate what we do next. What exactly should I be doing today? How should I be solving this particular problem? Not so much in the form of, this is the algorithm you should use for this particular case, but more along general lines of how to think about how your code fits into the larger picture. Typically, simple rules are limited in number. Ideally, there would be no more than, say, seven, because the human brain, we can handle about five to seven items, plus or minus a couple. And so if you can keep them all in your head, then in fact, you'll have a much, much better chance of remembering them and being able to act upon them and use them as a guideline for your decision making. They're tailored specifically to the problem you're trying to deal with. In other words, they're tailored specifically to the architecture that you're working in. The rules that you used at your last company for your last project, they may be similar, but they're never going to be exactly the same. The context is different. The environment is different. The problem is different. They should apply to a well-defined activity or decisions. Well, in this case, what am I going to do in terms of calculating the tax rate? That's a pretty well-defined activity. And provide clear guidance but allow for deviation. Because one of the problems we will frequently make is we will hold up these architectures and we will say everything should be this. During the early days of SOA, service orientation over in the Microsoft world. There was a gentleman, friend of mine, who uh, actually stood up on stage in front of uh, about 2,000 or so .NET developers and said, every class should be a service. Every single class should be its own Wisdel SOAP service. No exceptions in his world. And I love the man dearly, but let me tell you, I looked at some of the systems that were built with that particular guidance and I totally disagree with them. 
We have a tendency. I'm hearing some of the same things with some of the other architectures. I hear the Rastafarians standing up and proclaiming that rest is the only true way. I, I heard the object guys say the same thing back during the early days of Java. Everything has to be an object. It has to be an object. If it's not an object, it is just not worth talking about. It is just, you know, the stuff on the bottom of your shoe functions. Blah. And I hear the functional guys making the same argument. We are only now beginning to emerge from the dark age that objects have left us. That's from the guy who invented closure. Come on, that's just not right. The idea here is that we don't want to provide, we don't want to lock people down. There are places where objects make a tremendous amount of sense. If you think about the REST approach and how they talk about resources, right? Because this is all about representational state transfer. And so these resources are the representations are what we're shipping back and forth and so on. And that sounds a lot like data and these ideas that we have these verbs that we can apply to these resources, right? Get, put, delete, patch, uh, um, get, put, whatever, the, I'm missing one there. Post. Those sound like methods. There's actually some level of conceptual cognitive overlap between rest and object orientation. And yet, phenomenal amounts of implementation of these restful endpoints can be done in a functional language. There's no black, there's no white, it's all just varying colors of gray. But think about REST for just a second. Let's put it in this notion of simple rules, right? REST does have some very basic rules to it, right? A, everything should be attributable via URL. All of these resources should be explicitly tagged via URL. The only operations available to these resources should be expressible through the HTTP protocol, through those verbs. Now, we have to be careful because REST is not exactly the same as HTTP. When Fielding talked about the architectural style, he very deliberately left it wide open to say it doesn't always have to be HTTP. If you could follow these rules doing something else, you're still doing rest as far as Fielding was concerned. So for example, if you really want to get right down to it, we could ship PDF files over FTP if you really wanted to. And you could kind of get a pretty close approximation. Not surprising, HTTP works better because it was designed with rest in mind. But one of his other fundamental rules, hypermedia is the engine of application state, meaning all the state is contained in the resource, the representations that you're shipping back and forth. No state held on the server. Fielding does not like cookies. And he's got reasons for that. And a lot of us who have gone off and built restful implementations have blithely ignored that because it still works. And that's okay, because an architecture is a set of guidelines, it's a set of rules. I just rattled off four. And from that, you could build a pretty successful system. But there are gonna be places where you're gonna say, gosh, I can't put this state into the hypermedia document and ship it back because it's sensitive, it's secure information, and I can't run the risk of it being intercepted mid-flight or even intercepted on the client end. Or I don't even want the client to see it. Because remember, in any web application, there are always two front ends, the one that you build and Telnet. There is a story. Ages ago, when Dell Computer was first getting started selling computers online, they made, at that time, a very common mistake was to put the price of the thing being purchased into a hidden form field. Yeah, you can tell what's coming next. An enterprising young gentleman, not me, I swear. An enterprising young gentleman thought to himself, I wonder what would happen if. And so he tricked out the machine, and then instead of submitting that last step using the browser, he actually did so using Telnet and submitted a price of zero, which came back with an error. So he said, all right, 
I'll put in one. Dude ended up with a $10,000 workstation on his front doorstep for the price of $1 plus shipping and handling. (laughs) Now, the really fascinating part about this story, by the way, is Dell later found out, not surprising, accounting departments are pretty good at that sort of thing. They tracked him down. They went after him in court, charging him with fraud. The judge threw the case out of court because he said that's not fraud. And when Dell said, what do you mean? He said, well, imagine I walk onto a used car lot and I manage to talk the salesperson into selling the car for $1. That's not fraud, that's just really good negotiating skills. (laughs) Probably not a good idea to put the price into the document you ship back. You have to maintain some state somewhere on the server side. And Fielding is a brilliant man. I've I've had the opportunity to meet him. He's a brilliant guy. I love him. But in some cases, just because you're brilliant doesn't mean you're always right. Trust me, my wife will tell you. (laughs) All right, so architecture is a set of simple rules, right? And it's going to take some time because simple doesn't always mean easy, as many people can tell you. So then what exactly is an architect? Well, an architect fundamentally, I mean, I could make a tautology out of this and say an architect is someone who defines architecture. (laughs) But that's not a fun definition. Architects fundamentally do four things in their time as architects. First of all, they have to understand the goals. What exactly do we need as we build this system? What exactly are we trying to accomplish? How much modularity do we need? How much simplicity do we need? How much extensibility? How much reliability? Recoverability? There are all these itties, what some people will call non-functional requirements. I don't know about you guys, but reliability is kind of important. I don't like applying the term non-functional because if the site goes down, it is by definition non-functional. So a high degree of reliability kind of is a functional requirement. That's why I choose the much easier term, itties. It's an itty. And the funny thing is, all of these things, if you sort of lay them out, they can be kind of a set of sliders, right? If I were to ask the sound guy to walk back to his soundboard and push all those sliders up to the max, it's gonna sound awesome, right? You ever done that with like your favorite rock tune? It sounds terrible. It's absolutely awful. You do it when you're like 13 and you have no idea how an equalizer works. And then you like grow up and you discover, oh yeah, no, it actually helps to modulate some of these things. If I go long on this, I have to go short on this. If I go long on recoverability and so forth, I may have to go a little shorter on simplicity. If I go long on security, I may have to go a little bit shorter on performance because I can't take shortcuts. I have to verify every input at a whole bunch of different stages. If I go high on modularity, some of the coherence may actually drop off. You can't have it all. And so part of your job as an architect is to go look at your project, look at the context that you're in and decide which of these sliders you wanna go long and which ones you can afford to go short. And sometimes you will in fact have to make concessions that have nothing to do with the project goals at all. Look, it would be great if I had an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of time. I don't. And even if I did, the end result is not always gonna be good. There is a book that I will encourage you to read called Dreaming in Code. It's like a Stephen King novel for programmers because it's about a Silicon Valley millionaire, billionaire, whatever, who decided that he wanted to build an open source project that would kill off Microsoft Outlook. He was going to build a personal information manager that would stand the test of time, it would be open source, and it would be built the right way. So he assembled a group of Silicon Valley superstars and put them to work and said, there are no deadlines, just do the best thing that could happen. And do you know what happened? The project wasn't actually done by the time the book was published. So he couldn't say what the end result was, but the end result was a program called Chandler. Anybody ever used it? Like one hand back there, and even that is like, uh, yeah, okay, I'll admit it. (laughs) Chandler was a disaster. 
by any way you measure it. And part of the thing is you read through this book, the author was really expecting to be documenting one of the best well-run projects of all time because you've got all these superstars, how could it not? But instead, he would document things like programmers walking into a meeting and the programmers sit down and somebody else has now moved on and a new guy has come in and assumed the lead and the lead has decided, and at this point, you can feel it coming. Remember, the force, right? You feel it through the collective unconscious. This programmer decides, hey, I think we need to implement a new persistence store. So we're gonna rip out all of the old code that stored things to a local database and we're gonna put in new code to store things to a local database because reasons. And you're reading this book and you see to this and it's like, no, no, don't go to the meeting. Don't go to the meeting. I know what's gonna happen. Don't go to the, oh God, you went to the meeting. Damn it. There goes another programmer. You need to know the constraints of your team. Constraints are actually helpful. When you have to deliver a project in six months, that's actually a good thing because it lets you know, it puts an end cap on exactly what you need to deliver. And that's not me saying that, that's Fred Brooks. Mythical Man Month where he talks about, you know, you can't just throw more people onto the project. He's got a new, new book, The Design of Design, where he talks about how constraints actually serve to narrow the decision space significantly. So that if you know that you've got six months to turn this project out, you'll make very different decisions than if you have six weeks or six days. But part of the thing, once you've looked at that stuff and made some of those decisions, you always have to keep an eye on what's happening, not only with the project, but also with the business around you. The world changes. Your world changed significantly yesterday. The whole Brexit thing is going to have a ripple effect worldwide. And it's going to create some real interesting chaos. How does that affect your project? If you work in the financial sector, I guarantee you it's gonna have significant impact. Because now all of a sudden there are gonna be all these new business rules that will show up on your desk on Monday. They weren't there before, and it's not like the business can afford not to have them because hey, Britain is, you know, at least if they follow through on that non-binding referendum, they're not going to be a part of the EU anymore. Tariffs and taxes and border controls and all of that stuff is going to have to be put into place inside your software, maybe, depending, your business, the partners, etc. You need to keep an eye on everything that's going on around you so that you can be prepared for when your boss brings you into his office and says, okay, Look, I know we've been working really hard on this project for the last eight months, but those damn Brits, and we need to do this now. And instead of you standing up and saying, no, you agreed, you signed off, these are the stories, we've already primed the backlog, you say, okay, boss, we can deal with this. We're agile. The other two things you need to do though is you need to explore. And you've already done this. You've been here all week. You've listened to people, you'd listen to Matt Stein talk about some of the various things around cloud and you listen to Josh Long talk about reliability and circuit breaker. You listen to Doug talk about the JVM. You listen to Bruce talking about climbing mountains and pendulums and all kinds of interesting things. You guys have been here all week. You've been doing this, you've been exploring. You heard me talk about functional languages. You've heard a couple other people talk about functional data structures. You've been doing this. Now, part of the trick is to take this stuff back to the office and figure out what of it actually helps you. Because here's a really, really disappointing tip. Not everything you learned here will actually help you in your job. I know it's the dirty little secret that conference organizers don't want you to know. Now, whether it's half of it, three quarters of it, one quarter of it, I, I can't say, because that depends on where you work and what you're using and so forth. You should still come to conferences though, they're cool. Just you know, let's, let's make sure that, that stays out there. If nothing else, because it's a cool place where you can go hang out with fellow geeks, where nobody will look at you funny for wearing your Star Wars t-shirt. 
You need to be constantly exploring new stuff. If the conference, by the way, is the only place where you do that, you're shorting yourself. There's a wealth of resources out there online that will let you learn new things. And I encourage you to take advantage of them. I encourage you to take advantage of your tribe, the people around you. If you come to a conference without business cards, you're an idiot. And I mean that very seriously, because this is your perfect opportunity to make new friends, to open up your mind to new ideas, to hear people who are just like you doing things that are just like yours and maybe have different viewpoints. When you work in a group for a while, you all start to think along the same lines. Psychologists call that groupthink. You need to break out of the groupthink. You need to start thinking in other directions. And that doesn't always mean that you're going to be right. <clears throat> right. I'm still going through puberty. It means that you will have some new ideas that can then be evaluated. But unless you do this exploration, you're never, ever going to have those new ideas. And you're going to continue to believe that COBOL is the best language ever. The last thing you need to do is you need to lead. Look, if you're an architect, by definition, people have given you a title that implies a certain amount of technical oomph, strength, power, chutzpah. You need to use that power for good. You need to lead people. You need to mentor some of the other people on your staff. You need to show them, I mean, for starters, you have to show them how your architecture works. You have to explain the context behind the rules, etc. But you also need to look at some of these other things because there will be people on your staff who will be doing the same thing. They will be out looking around and one of them will come back and said, oh, I think we need to use Elm. I saw Bruce Tate do a talk and he said Elm is good, so we need to do Elm because Elm, because Bruce Tate, because Elm. <laughs> it, no, not elixir, shush, shush. You gotta be able to do this. You gotta be able to say why no elixir and yes to Elm, or why no Elm and yes elixir, or why you're totally out in left field, no way I'm not doing either of those things. We're sticking with COBOL, I mean Java. <laughs> you have to defend these things. You have to lead your team in the direction that they, you, the company, wants to go because you're at the plateau of the technical field, man. You're not getting any stronger. You're not getting any higher unless you go into management. And it's interesting because when we talk about all of these things and we talk about using the term architect, we, we're describing somebody who's very, very different from somebody who sits in his office and draws up building plans. What the building architect does and what a software architect does, they really are very, very different. The building architect is not like the best drywaller ever. He's not the best woodworker. He's an architect. He's been trained with an entirely separate set of skills. The software architect is very different from the building architect. I personally don't like the term architect. I wish we could sort of agree on something else. Which then leads us to start thinking about alternative metaphors. And the one that I kind of like the best is if you think about musical groups, an orchestra, a pit of 100 people sitting there all trying to play the same music, they all have the same score in front of them. There's no difference between the printed sheets of music, between the violins and the trombones and the percussion. So why do we have this guy at the front of the room waving a stick, gesturing very loudly in some cases? Why do we need that guy with the stick? Because the orchestra is doing all the work. It's funny because people, when they first get into music and they first go to symphonic uh, uh, concerts, they see the guy up front, and all he's doing is this. I mean, shit, I could do this. <laughs> I mean, come on, right? Oh, okay, occasionally I have to do it in four. All right, fine, four. Yeah, I could do four. All right, you want to do three? I could do three. Shoot, I'm an orchestra. I I'm a conductor. Pay me the hundreds of thousands of dollars that that conductor earns. Stop it. What exactly the good does the conductor provide? Well, to be very blunt, part of his job, part of her job, is to meld all of those disparate individuals into a coherent whole. Part of the conductor's job is to look at what he has in front of him. 
Maybe he's got an orchestra that has three trumpets and seven trombones for whatever reason. And he has to start thinking, wow, how am I going to adapt? Because otherwise the trombones will drown out the trumpet. How do I adapt the score to take advantage of the fact that I'm very trombone heavy and a little trumpet light? Maybe I've got a really talented first violinist. How do I bring that out? How do I accentuate their skills? How do I meld all of these different things together into a coherent whole such that the result is more than the sum of its parts? Which is very much like what an architect, software architect is trying to do. And then occasionally, we get to those musical groups where they don't have a conductor, right? You go look at any modern rock band, there's no conductor there. There's no guy standing in front of the bass guitarist going like this, right? Because now the group is small enough. And if, you, if you've ever played in any band, even if you didn't have an explicit conductor, there was typically a leader. It was typically somebody that was making some of those decisions. But they all shared some of this expertise. They all shared their vision. Hey, man, I think it would be really cool if, like, we do this a little bit differently. Maybe we can insert, you know, lead guitar solo here for eight measures, and then we can flip back to the bass, let him... They're all collectively working on this piece together because the number of people interacting with one another is actually relatively small. There's other metaphors here that we can think about in terms of replacement if you don't like conductor. A stage or a set director, the director of a movie, they put the pieces out on stage, they decide that they're gonna have these foam letters here, they're gonna have this big screen here, we're gonna put the table off to the left. Why the left, why not the right? Why not the center? What other people are gonna be allowed to be up on stage? What is the lighting gonna look like, etc.? The director's not physically on the stage, but his or her job is to make the actors look good, to get the most amount out of their people. And they do that by setting some of those rules in place. Your character is angry. You're very angry. You're mad at the world. The actor goes, okay, I'm mad at the world. Grr. Unless you're Keanu Reeves, and then you're just Keanu. <laughs> but the director gives those directions. They, they establish those things in terms of those rules so that the actors can keep that straight. I had a very interesting experience a number of years ago. I actually saw Phantom of the Opera, the, uh, uh, the musical. I saw it twice. Once with the original Phantom, and then once with... Um, uh, and I can't remember his name now, the black guy uh, who replaced him. Uh, uh, his name will come to me later. But the interesting thing is, these two guys were playing exactly the same part. The music was the same, the score was the same, and yet they played two very, very different characters. The first was very bitter and angry and self-loathing. The second was much more pitiful was much more just beaten down. The world had treated him unfairly and he was just sort of retreating into an introverted shell. Same lyrics, same music, sung very, very differently. It wasn't necessarily that the director told them to do it any differently, but he was looking to enact, to pull out from the actor what their interpretation of that character was, etc. So even it's the same show, the rules, they still have some room within them to grow, to flow, to change. They're heuristics, they're not algorithms. All of this, very high level, very foofy, but it's not really. Because fundamentally, when you come right back to it, what is architecture? It's a set of answers. It's a set of answers to questions that the developers will ask. And it's your job as an architect to figure out what those questions are and then provide them with answers and frame them in such a way that the developers don't have to keep going back to a 50-page document which was outdated the day you published it. If you can put all of your architectural rules on one sheet of paper, it will stand the test of time, they will follow it, and you will have an architecture that other people in this room would have risen their hand for if they were working on it. So your job, if you want to be an architect, is to take what you've learned here, take the weekend, think about where it fits, and go back, find your teams, and say, this is what we do next. Peace.